Good morning, sophomores. I hope that you guys are having a beautiful day. Um, it's time for us to really start cracking in and taking an look at Jesus' actual life. Over the last few weeks, we've kind of been preparing for that. And we've talked about how God prepared us to receive uh, uh, this new Messiah, right? Last week, we spent a lot of time talking about the immediate preparation. Like, what did God do in the moment? Uh, before that, we talked about, you know, um, how, you know, the Old Testament, they were looking for towards this Messiah, and then last week we especially started to talk about Mary. I didn't get a chance to go into Joseph much, I wish, wish I could have. Uh, but nonetheless, it's time for us to kind of move on and actually look at Jesus in the world. Now, I'm going to skip the whole uh, 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 infancy narrative. In other words, the story of Jesus' birth. Let's just save that for Christmas. We'll talk about it then. And believe it or not, this is going to sound odd, but it's true. It's easier to understand what's happening at Jesus' birth after you've really seen the whole of his life and his death, because Jesus is one of the one of the uh, has this odd reality in that we almost kind of have to look at his life a little bit backwards to really understand what's going on, because everything in his life is leading towards its conclusion. You see, for us, we were born to live. Right? We were born to, to, to get out in the world and to see all the different things that God wants us to see, and to experience God's love both here in this world and forever in the next. That we're, that, that, that To know, love, and serve God is, is like our whole life. But for Jesus, who is God, Jesus' point to his life is a bit different. So his life is actually lived with a different mind. Our, we were born to live, Jesus is born to die. We'll find out more about that, especially as we kind of start looking towards the later part of his life. But before we do that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to, or we'll do that long down the road, um, I'd like to start this off by looking at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And the beginning of his ministry really starts in this enigmatic moment. There's this incredible pause in the story. And the pause ends, like we talked about last week, ends with this prophecy of Malachi. He's coming soon, and Elijah will come before him to announce his way. That the Elijah, the great, loud, wild, crazy prophet that he was, that Elijah is somehow going to, to prepare the way of the Lord. That the, He's going to be the one to point him out. And then, out of nowhere, we have this man named John. And John is a wild man. I mean, he he he's 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 crazy. He's one of these. He's um super ultra religious, like heavy duty, like jump up on a soapbox and yell kind of guy. But he really lives it out. Like he's not like one of these uh, crazy people. Like he's just super intense. And he he's also a really heavy ascetic. Now ascetic. What an ascetic is, is somebody who, who denies the flesh, who denies, who doesn't eat much food, who, who, who like tries to, to deny the flesh in order to live by the spirit. So he lives in the desert. He lives on grasshoppers and honey. Um, he doesn't eat normal food. He just he eats only what he finds. He, he doesn't have normal clothes. He has clothes that are super scratchy, itchy, like a, a, a penitential clothes. And he's, he's, he's a wild man. And the man comes out and, he's, and, and he starts preaching. And people are coming to listen to him from all over the place. Because they love his, his intensity. They love that he's real. Like, I don't know about you, but the thing that drives me crazy more than anything else is people who are fake. Right? They, like, say one thing, but they don't mean it. John is not fake. John is living out the story that he's talking about. He's cut, and what is he telling them to do? Well, let's take a look. <clears throat> in those days, John the Baptist appeared, preaching in the desert of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, turn around. Stop, being, stop doing the wrong things. Do a 180, because... It, it's here. It's like not, it's coming. It's coming now. It's not coming in a million years. It's coming tomorrow. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right here. It's time to turn, it's time to start acting like it. 
because he's coming, right? And it was him that the prophet Isaiah spoke, a voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. John wore clothing made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. He, his food was locusts and wild honey. And at that time, all Jerusalem, all Judea, and the whole region around the Jordan were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. Well, what is this baptizing thing? Well, to be baptized just means to be washed, right? So it's like a ritual washing. Like, what do you do when you go take a shower? Well, you're washing off all the dirt and the grime, and you're getting rid of all of the bad stuff that's on you, right? This was like a religious experience of that. So they were coming out, and they were saying, John, I want to fix my life. You're right. I have been living bad. I haven't been doing the things that God's called me to do, and I want to change that because what you're saying is real, and I want to be a part of that. And so John would come in, and he would say, well, then come here, and they would wash away it was just a it was just a it was a symbol, right? By him baptizing them, that dunking them in the water, it's like they were being having a, a washing away all of the evil and starting their life over. It's just a wonderful symbol of of trying to recreate and do things right. And many of the Pharisees, like the bad guys, no, not bad guys, they're the good guys. Like these are the really good guys. Like um, these are like the religious leaders and, and the people who are actually trying their hardest to, to really do the good stuff. And he he is mean to them. I mean mean. He studies these Pharisees and Sadducees. These are people who are trying to, 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 to... They're the religious leaders, right? And he calls them, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Provide good fruit as evidence of your repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves that we are children of Abraham. God could raise children of Abraham from these stones. In other words, he's saying they're hypocrites. They're saying one thing and they're not acting on it. They're acting, you might know this term, holier than thou. Like they're more special than everybody else because they're religious and everybody else is just somehow not good enough. John calls him out. He is really brash, and he will say anything to anybody. Like, you can't stop this guy. Like, later on, he's going to be killed because of this. His mouth is going to get him in so much trouble that they're going to cut off his head. But he doesn't care. He knows that's true, and he speaks anyway. And this is just exactly why people love him. And they love him, right? Um, they're coming from all around the place. And then, in the midst of this, comes this moment where Jesus comes to John. And it's just a normal day. John's doing his thing. He's preaching. He's baptizing. He's doing the stuff. And he sees Jesus. And the moment he sees Jesus, everything changes. He sees Jesus, and Jesus comes up to him and looks him in the face. And John, the wild, crazy John who calls out everybody, who, who has no problem, like, like even to the most highest officials saying, you're a viper, a snake in the grass, looks at Jesus and says these words, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me I am not worthy to untie your sandals. To untie somebody's sandals is to be their servant. And Jesus says to him in reply, Allow it now, for it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. And he allowed him. And as Jesus was baptized, he came up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened. Light shone down from the sky, for lack of a better term. And the Holy Spirit of God came like a dove and landed on him. And a voice came from the heaven, the voice of the Father, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. This blew John away. Like John had just fulfilled his entire life. His one task was to point to the Lamb of God. And there he is watching it happen. 
what it must have been like for John. I mean, he'd spent his whole life focused on trying to be the best prophet that he could be, to do all that God had called him to do, to, to, to say the hardest, nastiest, meanest thing if that's what God wanted him to do, to, to live in the hardest possible way if that's what God called him to do. And he did it. He did it every second of his life. He wouldn't stop. He was an incredible man. And now to see this moment where everything he dreamt of would be fulfilled, this must have been for John the most incredible moment of his entire life. To be able to touch, to be able to touch Jesus and to be able to make him known to everyone else. This is the beginning. This is where it starts. But the very first thing that happens is the Spirit of God calls Jesus to move into the desert and to go spend some time in prayer before he begins his ministry. And so Jesus does this. He goes into the desert, and there he's tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, what else happens that's 40 days? Well, I can't think of anything that's 40 days. But the Israelite people, after they left Egypt, were in the desert for 40 years. So 40 years in the desert, that's what, they, that's what with Moses and all the people of Israel, that's what they had to do. And now Jesus is in the desert for 40 days. Are you seeing a connection here? That somehow Jesus is like, in himself, is kind of like a new Israel. And this is exactly what we're going to see happen here in the desert. Jesus is going to go out in the desert, and there he's going to be tempted. He's going to be tempted three times. And these temptations come with all of the strength that Satan can muster. Now, Satan doesn't fully know what's going on here. He knows who Jesus is. And he knows what Je that Jesus is, is, is not all that he normally is. And so he thinks, this is my chance. This is my chance to tempt God himself. And he does not hold back, but in fact tempts him in the strongest way possible. And the temptations he gives are not to be missed. There are three. The first one, Jesus led by the Spirit into the desert and tempted by the devil. He fasts for 40 days, doesn't eat any food, for 40 days and 40 nights. And afterwards... I always thought this was the funniest line in all of Scripture, by the way. I think this is pure humor. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards, he was hungry. <laughs> like, duh, you haven't eaten for 40 days. Yeah, he's hungry. Uh-huh. <laughs> the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. If you're really, if you, you can do anything you want, can't you? I mean, all you've got to do is make some, make some bread. Just make it happen right here and then you'll be fine. And Jesus says, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. In other words, God's word's the food I need. I don't need food of the body. Then the devil took him to the holy city made him stand on the parapet of the temple, right there at the top of the temple, and said to him, if you're really the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written. He's using Scripture. Just in case you're wondering, the devil knows the Bible too. He will command his angels concerning you, and with their hands they will support you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. God will protect you. You are all powerful, are you not? Throw yourself from the building. And Jesus said again, it is written. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Then the devil took, took him up to a very high mountain. He's about to pull out the biggest, baddest gun he has. Here it is, the big temptation. Took him to the high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and said, all of these I shall give to you. It's all yours. You can be the ruler of everything. You can have all the money, all the wine, all the women, all of it. It's all yours. If you'll worship me. Just worship me and you can have the whole world. Notice, Jesus doesn't say you can't do that. 
Jesus doesn't say you don't have that power. Because he knows that Satan does have that power. God gave him that power. And at this, Jesus instead says, Get away from me, Satan, for it is written, The Lord is your God, you shall worship, and him alone will you serve. I want you to notice something. Here's what happens. Remember, 40 days, like the 40 years. These three temptations are the exact three temptations that the Israelites failed in the desert. As the Israelites were going in the desert, and they were doing all the things that, that, they, that, that God was trying to lead them into becoming the peace, his own people, they would keep making the biggest, dumbest, stupidest mistakes. The very first thing they did, they were in the desert, and they literally just walked through the Red Sea, like the waters, like a wall on either side of them. And they've just seen incredible miracles that God has performed for them. And their very first thing when they're back on the other side is, I'm hungry. We're going to starve out here. We're all going to die. This was stupid. And so what does God do? God sends manna. Well, Jesus is tempted the same way. The angel, or the, or excuse me, the devil says to him, you know, I know you're hungry. You can just make this into bread. It'll all be fine. And Jesus, Jesus undoes the mistake that the Israelites made. That he is faithful to God despite his, his hunger, despite his bodily needs, despite what's going on in the moment. He knows God will take care of him, and he just trusts it. The one thing the Israelites couldn't do. And then, after that, the, 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 the people of, Israelite, are, of Israel are tempting God all the time. They're like, if God really is here, have him do this. If God is really here, have him do that. If Do some miracle for us, God. Like, how many miracles do you want? You walked through the Red Sea. You saw the seven plagues. You've seen so many miracles. It's crazy. Why are you tempting God? And so when, G, when the devil tries to tempt Jesus, saying, look, let's do a miracle. It'll be amazing. God will do it for you. Jesus says, I will not put God to the test. I know who he is. And he knows who I am. And that's enough. Again, he undoes the, 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 the Israelite people's disobedience. He's fixing everything. He's repairing everything that came before. He's repairing all of history with just this, these, these few actions. And last but not least, he says, I will give you everything, everything, if you will just worship me just once, just once. I'll give you the whole world. And just as the Israelite people while God was on the mountain giving the Ten Commandments to Moses. They're, he's literally up there getting the Ten Commandments. And what do they do? They get bored. They make an idol, a golden calf, and they start worshiping it. But Jesus will not make the same mistake. He says, The Lord your God you shall worship. Him alone will you serve. In other words, Jesus is repairing all the damage of history. In the same way, in a very similar way, these things also relate to what happened to Adam. I don't have time to go into that because we're already almost 20 minutes in. But you're going to see that what, what Jesus is doing is he's repairing all of history. Like all of the mistakes that men have made, he's doing it right. He's fixing it. He's, he's undoing our, our evil and replacing it with obedience and good. It's incredible what's happening here. So here's, here's, here's what we got this week. We got this enigmatic John the Baptist, this Elijah, this prophet like Elijah, who comes forth and he's wild and crazy, but, but really just like one of those crazy in a really good way kind of guys, right? And he is the one who recognizes who Jesus is and points him out to the crowds. And then, and, and, and then he baptizes him. Then we have this movement in the desert where Jesus is tempted three times by the devil and that these three temptations are the hallmark are the hallmark temptations like all of our temptations can be summed up in these three temptations every temptation we have can be summed up in these I don't have time to go through that but but like this is this is how we're tempted 
and Jesus beats it all. He rewrites history. He, he is the new Israel, just in his person. He, as the Messiah, is taking on all of the weight and all of the power and all of the, 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 the mistakes. He's, he's doing it all, all through his own actions. There's a whole lot happening here, huh? Next week, we're going to be taking a closer look at uh, Jesus' miracles. But I wanted to make sure that you get like, that you see the land, the, the landscape here, that Jesus is coming forth with, as, as the great healer, as the one who's bringing everything back to center, that he's the one who's repairing all the damage, and he's the one who's being announced. It's very, very clear that this is a pretty wild thing that's happening here. So look forward to seeing you during the week. God bless you, and I hope you guys have a lovely uh, weekend and all that. I'll see you next week. God bless.